Hello and welcome to the Randomly Generated History Club, where three non-historians pick a year at random and try to learn things about it. I'm Will and I'm here with my two friends, Ant and Anna. Hi there. Hello. This year we're talking about the year 1732 Mm -hmm. and I'd like each of us to give our three word preview of what we're discussing today. Ant. Lots of ships. Anna. (laughs) Still got it. (laughs) And then your three words. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and my three words are lines on maps oh, oh. boy <laughs> <laughs> good great okay here we go this week i'm going to talk about the pen calvert boundary dispute oh finally <laughs> which is also known as pen versus baltimore mm. Or Penn v. Baltimore, I guess. Penn v. See, Baltimore is the way it's mm. often. Is it sort of Supreme Court ruling? It is. Yeah. Penn versus Baltimore. It is. Ve- <laughs> <laughs> it is a very no long running legal conflict. No, not it's not Supreme Court actually, because we're in 1732 and there was no Supreme Court. Oh, that's right, because there, in fact, wasn't an America. <laughs> right. Yeah, okay. okay. Minor detail. Great. Okay. So this is a very long-running legal conflict over who owned which bits of North America in the 1700s and 1800s, and it had some pretty significant implications. For- Spoiler alert. It was the indigenous people. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Oh, yes. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that they were not involved in the dispute. We breathed right past that issue. Good (laughs) Good to clarify. (laughs) I also agree with the position that they had a very legitimate claim. And it had big implications for the future United States and, and for the world, really. So it began as a dispute between William Penn and his subsequent heirs on one side and this guy called Charles Calvert, also called the third Baron Baltimore. Mm. He sounds and, evil. Yeah. Yeah. Baron is objectively the evilest sounding mm. Viscount's title. pretty bad. Viscount sounds mischievous, mm. I would say. And his heirs on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> but Baron Baltimore's heirs. Baron Baltimore's okay. heirs. So Penn's heir, Penn and his heirs, Calvert slash Baron Baltimore and his heirs. And the overlap here, there was an overlapping uh, set of charters on the, of the land in colonial America that required a whole bunch of different attempts to mediate and to survey and resurvey, and then there were interventions from the kings and the courts and whole different and, and, and on loads of different levels over multiple decades. And subsequent questions over these charters have also been adjudicated by uh, American arbitrators, and in fact later on by the Supreme Court. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Uh, but obviously only when, when there was one. Yeah. Uh, and the boundary dispute eventually shaped the borders of five US states. Hmm. Can you name any of them, Anna? I can name several of them because Penn is the eponymous founder of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. That is confirmed. Baltimore. Is in... Uh, you know it. Uh, Maryland. Yep. Nice. Uh, Mississippi, maybe? No. Is that too no, far? No, you're way off. <laughs> then I would say maybe... Florida. Do we get into sort of Jersey? Yeah. Which Jersey? Old Jersey. New. Old oh, Jer- sorry. <laughs> sorry. The newest one. Correct. Uh, do we have a little bit of Delaware in the mix? You do. You're, you're, you're four out of five. And I God, would say the so last one would be Virginia? Virginia. But which Virginia? Regular Virginia? No! no! West Virginia. West Virginia. Yes. Oh. Oh, it's very good going, mama. though. Thank you. Good knowledge of your country yes. and the stuff that's in it. <laughs> so it all started in 1629 when a guy called Samuel Godin sent agents of the Dutch West India Company to oh. negotiate with the local Indian tribe. <laughs> sorry, sorry, quote, negotiate, unquote, uh-huh. yeah. to purchase land in Delaware. And then three years later, in 1632, King Charles I granted a guy called Cecil Calvert who was a second barrel Baltimore, a charter for land along the Chesapeake Bay. But the charter only grant, granted the Calverts the right to, quote, uncultivated, uh, unquote, lands. Mm. And the colonists arrived then in 1634, but they made no attempts to survey the northern border. So basically, we're off to the races. Yep, yeah. There's loads of ambiguity yep. already. Great. And this then caused all the problems that followed. They just want to like, do you want to go see it before you buy it? Like, no, 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 I'm sure it's no, fine. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> I'm sure it's all uncultivated. This won't come back to bite me, I'm sure. <laughs> it's uncultivated by me and yeah. therefore uncultivated. So, so there were so what followed were a whole load of disputes between the Dutch, the British and the Swedes who were also in the mix at the time. Huh. Yeah. You don't ever really think about them. And all these people argued with each other over who had 
claimed what first. And that carried on for another 47 years. Oh, my God. Until in 1681, William Penn was granted a charter for Pennsylvania by Charles II. Okay. And the new Lord Baltimore at that time, who was the, the son of mm-hmm. the previous guy. Mm-hmm. So, and by the way, this is like a multi generational thing. We yeah. go through multiple Lord Baltimores. Hatfields and McCoys. <laughs> yeah. Just like, yeah, carrying on the feud through the ages. Yeah, it just, just goes on and on. And so they didn't object. At that point, Lord, the new Lord Baltimore didn't object to that grant, okay. so long as Penn's land was north of the 40th parallel. So Penn sailed to the colonies, and in May. 1683 he met Calvert to try to sort out who owned what but the two men immediately disagreed uh-huh. on how the boundaries should be decided including where the southern border of Pen- uh, southern boundary of Pennsylvania was at all was Penn famous for having not wanting any southern border and for to stretch all the way down <laughs> all the way down <laughs> yeah. to the gulf of mexico <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's mine he yeah he was pretty aggressive well well actually he wasn't because he was a quaker famously oh, so non great oats right Really good oats. But p- potentially... Did he get a bit fighty? Potentially a pedant. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, probably. And probably, I think I, th- I think Quakers can still be keen on earning money, can't they? So, uh, like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I think he was going for whatever is profit maximizing. And, and this meeting then between Calvert and Penn in 1683 marked the beginning, really, of the very, very long active legal dispute. So before there'd been ambiguity, and now they were like actively yeah, quarreling yeah, yeah, yeah. over what... Litigation. Uh, was, exactly. So fast forward another 50 years... <laughs> To the year in question, 1732. It still hasn't been resolved. Oh, no way. Um, Seven years of just like bickering about... So so by this time, the descendants on both sides had been quarrelling about this and neither side had been backing down. And it got more and more important because the colonists had grown hugely in this time Mm -hmm. in terms of population, in terms of the economic, uh, well, both the size of their economies now and the obvious economic potential for future decades of these things. All the merch they bought. A lot of merch. (laughs) A lot of merch. But to clarify, like in that earlier period, 100 years before, you know, lots of these colonies were kind of tenuous, barely struggling to survive. And now they're very established established large Mm -hmm. you know going places colonies and so it all came down to the fact that calvert insisted the boundary should remain at the 40th parallel whilst the pair went while the pens argued that it should be placed 20 miles south of pennsylvania (laughs) so that was really what it was all about yeah and to put a stop to all this nonsense the king convinced the two sides to come to a compromise 10 miles (laughs) and on the uh, on may the 10th 1732 Calvert and the Pens signed an article of agreement, which uh, and uh, which stated that that boundary should be Pennsylvania's southern boundary, mm-hmm. uh, but then conveniently moved that boundary to just below the 40th parallel. <laughs> uh, and so, and so, everyone was kind of happy yeah. for a while. Yeah, but. Fast forward another 29 years. Oh, my God. <laughs> it just goes on. And yeah. And, and there were still some disputes because the maps used in that previous agreement mm. had... Guess what? Not been, been surveyed. Not been, yeah, not been, <laughs> again, not been accurately created. I mean, they only had, had what, been, 142 years yeah. or whatever it is. Right. The you, thing is, their big mistake was they let uh, the, the great grandson of William Penn just draw the map with his crayon. Yeah. <laughs> so the maps, the maps were both poorly produced mm. and then also additionally incorrectly marked. Okay. <laughs> That's also, yeah. So enter two surveyors who were contracted by both the Penns and the Baltimores to go out map the whole thing out mm-hmm. properly and try once and for all to sort out who owned what. I can, can anyone guess the names I of those I was going to say, I bet I know oh, their names. Yes. I bet one was called Mason and one was called Dixon. That's correct. Hey! Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon oh, right, okay. then set out to establish the boundaries and they became known as the Mason-Dixon boundaries mm-hmm. On uh, and they were established on August the 20th. 1768 after they had gone through their um, process of surveying the whole thing. And King George approved those boundaries in 1769... (laughs) Huh. Over 85 years after the beginning of the dispute. And uh, yeah, and, and clearly for anyone who knows really anything at all about American history. Well, Anna, you described the significance of the Mason-Dixon line. Well, it became quite important in the Civil War, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in terms of deciding what was the North and what was the South. <laughs> yes, yeah, obviously. Right. And, then, and then arguably has like, yeah. well, very significant cultural and societal implications yeah, definitely. stemming from that war, right? Ever since. Really good barbecue south of there. Really, <laughs> yeah, you nailed it. It's accurate. That's top of the list. That's it. Yeah. And then north is just <laughs> approaches uh, to barbecues. Yeah. A lot of um, woods. <laughs> yeah. Very woodsy. Did the British 
uh, learn from their mistake here by in letting people have a voice in the negotiations when they later drew all the lines on all the maps in, for instance, the Middle East. They did not. Okay, <laughs> great. Well, <laughs> uh, and guess what happened after all of that to these lands and to the family's claims? Bear in mind. The king approved the boundaries in 1769. Oh, yes. In ah. fact, famously, several years later, the king was no longer the, the king, king. king of, America. <laughs> in, of America. In this part of the world. <laughs> yes. So oh, wow. after all You're of that, seven years later, both families lost all claims to wow. everything. Of course. That's, that's amazing. Wowzers. <laughs> And that was that. So they'd spent uh, their entire time squabbling and they got to enjoy it for a sweet, sweet seven years. That is so sad for them. I mean, to be clear, Penn did get his name in Pennsylvania and the Baltimores did become the location of arguably one yeah. of the greatest TV shows of all time. <laughs> so there is that. I mean, there's a lesson in it for all of us, really. I think I'm actually going to give up my land dispute with my neighbour. <laughs> yeah, uh, life's too short. Yeah, he's built his fence a little bit too much into my uh, property. So. Do you want me to come in and mediate? Uh, I don't think you would draw the lines <laughs> fairly I'll do, I'll in my favour. I'll, I'll deal with this. Is <laughs> the, he cultivating the land? <laughs> the, the Anna Will line would not suit me, I think. You know, I don't think so. <laughs> Right, today for my section in 1732, I'm going to take you on a little trip to Spain. Ooh, so Spain, caliente. yes, caliente and picante at the same time. Mm. Um, uh, I don't know any of the words. Okay. <laughs> so you're going to have to guide me here. <laughs> good. Um, but as a bit of a background, uh, Spain at this time still had a fairly large influential empire. Okay. It was much weakened, not as coherent, but still very relevant and still an economic force to be reckoned with. It spanned parts of Spanish Netherlands, uh, large parts of Italy, the Philippines, and much of the Americas. Um, but in 1700, when King Charles II died, he didn't have any kids. Which oh. is like just a running theme. Yeah, we've always, learned that that's a bad way to kids. preserve your Yeah, if you're, you're going to be a king. Yeah. Um, so this kicked off the wars of succession between the would-be heirs. So on one hand, there was Philip of Anjou, which was backed by the French, mm -hmm. and Charles of Austria, backed by uh, um, the Austrians. Oh. <laughs> uh, and they had various claims and supporters from across Europe and all the different powerhouses there. Um, so it's a pan-European sort of political intrigue and bit of a conflict with a lot at stake. The French wanted to seize control uh, of, uh, of Spain and have it as effectively as a vassal state. The British didn't want the French to succeed at anything. Yep. <laughs> uh, the Spanish wanted to say Spanish. The Italians <laughs> wanted parts of Italy back, etc. So there's lots of... Um, the Austrians sort of, were just having fun. E e Austrians were having fun, yeah. yeah. Uh, but there was a lot of unrest <laughs> and shifting of powers. And, uh, and as such, like... Land sort of changed hands this time. It was quite fluid as, you know, eventually Philip, you know, rose to the throne. Um, uh, but during this time, the strategic African cities of Oran, O-R-A-N, and Mers al-Kabir in Algeria were taken back by the Moors during the con reconquest of Oran by the Bay of Mascara. So ah. B-E-Y, a bay is a title yeah. of, a, of oh, wow. a lord in North Africa, yeah. and of Mascara, the Bay of Mascara, which is great. And his name was Mustafa Bouchalegem. Maybelline. A Maybelline, yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the Bay of Mascara. <laughs> he took it via a siege. He cut off all the trade routes. They could only resupply by sea, and Classic. they capitulated, and he was able to take it. So it was great, great, great for them. Well done him. Uh, King Philip's now on the throne, and he wanted to make his mark, sort of, re-solidify the empire and he decided that he was going to mount an expedition to get back these two lost cities. Uh, very strategic trading routes there. In, the in Algeria. In Algeria. Presumably on the coast yeah, on the then. Yeah, okay. Um, and this campaign was funded very nicely because they had just had a very successful uh, sort of effective sacking of Genoa where they brought the fleet along and said, hey, we're going to bombard your city unless you give us loads of money. So they effectively bullied them into giving them Great. like millions and millions of, of, of Spanish dollars. Uh. I, I can't remember the <laughs> currency, uh -huh. but I'm assuming it's Spanish dollars. Um, and so uh, they mounted this massive, massive force with troops from all over mercenaries as well as Spanish troops. There was about 32 battalions, uh, which is approximately 30,000 troops, which wow. include regiments from Ireland, Switzerland, and my favourite, the Walloon Guards. Oh, nice. Yeah, the who, Walloons were there. Who are the Walloons? 
The Walloons. The Belgians, oh. yeah. The uh, elite Belgian. Well, there Belgian was no Belgian, Belgian was there, well, but. Yeah. They're Walloonian. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> and they were they were all gathered in Ale- Al- Al- uh, Alicante. Yep. Uh, party town. Just a good place to. to yeah. Place to sure is. Uh, so they're having mojitos. <laughs> it was great. Uh, but very I've small town. many invasions from <laughs> Alicante. In fact, I'm not allowed to go back there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and at the head of this uh, sort of expedition was Don Jose Carrillo del Albornoz. Uh, Albornoz. Oh, gosh. And you got some of those syllables <laughs> got some, right. Got I'm, some I'm of those certain right. of it. He was the Duke of Montemar, okay? Okay. Oh, just, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, we all know yeah. that guy. Yeah, 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 that guy. Um, and so the fleet set sail with 12 ships of the line, 50 frigates, 7 galleys, 26 galleots, 4 brigs, 97 zebex, and several gunboats and bomb vessels, approximately... Sorry, like, 97 zebex? 97 zebex, yeah. Wow, that X- is a... a more than I would take. More That's, than I would yeah, take. Yeah, I would probably... I would cap it at sort of 85. <laughs> 85. It's yeah. a lot to handle. It's yeah, a lot it really of zebex. How many sloops were there? There were zero sloops, according to this. Oh. Uh, but it was... Well, there, there might be in the mix, who knows, because there's approximately five to 600 ships in total. And Jesus. so vast was this fleet, a writer at the time stated, never before was the Mediterranean Sea covered in such a variety of flags, which I'm assuming were attached to the ships. <laughs> <laughs> Unless there's a separate like sort of yeah, thing yeah. going on as well there. That was the famous Mediterranean Sea quilt. <laughs> yeah. Well, they get to Algeria and they disembark after some bad weather. So they had to stand off from the bay and wait till the next day. So the Algerians are just waiting to ambush them effectively. Yeah. And the Algerians, they try to attack, but the firepower of the Spanish ship is just too great. And they cover the landing troops and they just, you know, decimate them before they can they can do much. Mm. And before midday, the majority of them had disembarked. So imagine just the the effort of disembarking thirty thousand troops yeah. onto the shore is just like that is a long. That's queue. a lot. Yeah, a long queue. Um, and they pushed up the hill, and they were pretty decisive. About twenty to twenty two thousand men in total from the from the Moors were on the field, um, and the Grenadiers were really winning the day for them uh, from the Spanish side. The firepower was just withering, and then they laid siege and took Murs el Kabir where the Algerians laid down their arms and negotiated, please just let us go back to, you know, Algeria, Maine, yeah. and we'll, we'll, we'll not fight you anymore. Yeah. Uh, and the Spanish then went on to take Iran fairly easily because it was abandoned. <laughs> <laughs> they just up and left. Okay. As was the palace of the bay. Um, so that's perfect, right? Yeah, it's great. Great. Well, not for the Algerians, but no, great, great for the Spanish. For <laughs> so this, this, the Spanish waltzed in there and they captured the places back. They captured tons of artillery, innumerable artifacts of war uh, supplies they had about three months of supplies they captured so like the, mm. the Algerians could have wow. withstood a siege for a while at least beans. Uh, lots of tinned beans yeah. North African tinned beans uh-huh. very very tasty <laughs> um, just tagines everywhere <laughs> I love a tagine, just as a sidebar. <laughs> um, so, so what of this? I mean, like, you know, they've managed to capture these two. Spain's empires a little bit back in the ascendancy again. Uh, the news spread to Spain and onto Europe uh, and was celebrated widely. Um, obviously, some trepidation with the English because the French and Spanish were now a little bit connected. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the Pope, Clement, he was delighted. He was like, brilliant. We've got some more Christian cities in North Africa again. Uh, this is great. Famously forgiving. Famously <laughs> forgiving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I prefer Pope Inclement, uh, the, <laughs> oh, yes. the Pope God of Snow. <laughs> um, and then Philip uh, of Spain, King Philip, he rewards uh, the, the Duke of Montemor with the chain of the Order of the Golden Fleece. So, so him oh, and the He Admiral, made that up, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. He basically did. You yeah. have the chain of the Order <laughs> of the... Uh, yeah, 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 the Golden Fleece, something like that, yeah. Um, <laughs> so so Bey Hassan uh, was not super happy about this, obviously. No, yeah. He regretted his cowardice uh, by abandoning the city, and so he tried many, many times to retrieve it over the following months. So the Spanish basically left a garrison of about 6,000 troops there and, and then came back. Uh, but they were defeated every single time. Even when he massed 10,000 troops to try and take the city, um, he suffered up to 2,000 cal- uh, casualties. And as a consequence, the city actually remained under Spanish control hmm. till 1792. Wow. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah. So uh, Why did he give it up in the first place? Uh <laughs> Was oh, cowardice? So- he's just yeah, yeah. Cowardice. Actually, well, he's just a coward. Yeah, he's well. I mean, in, fa- in fairness to him, there was thirty thousand yeah. men, grenadiers included amongst them. Yeah, uh, they had ships of the line. They had ninety-seven zebex. That's true. You, <laughs> that's you a- forgot how many zebex they had. <laughs> that's a lot of zebex. So you know, in the face of that withering firepower and number of flags, a uh, lot of flags. Oh. I, there's a fine line between cowardice and like reading the writing on the wall yeah, yeah, and being one. like, all of my people are going to be slaughtered. Yeah, History yeah. 
There are three options. Okay, here we go. <laughs> the first option, which most people take, is that history won't remember them. Yeah. Yeah. The second option is that history remembers you for your extreme cowardice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and the, the third, third option is you are Will Blythe. <laughs> is that you're remembered for never ever backing down under any circumstances <laughs> yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even even though you probably should have done every now and again. And there are no other options. Yeah. Well, you can decide who you think Bey Hassan, the Bay of Mascara, was. Do so. Weird. <laughs> Coward. Decision made. <laughs> Decision made. All right. That's pronounced the final judgment. Cool. Well, I today actually Will and I have done a bit of a Freaky Friday because oh, he spoke you about bodies? we we swapped bodies. I feel so powerful. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to make a lot of great decisions. Uh, no, he spoke about what would become America. I'm going to tell a little story about uh, somebody in the UK. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, in some of our harder episodes, we've often used the fact that someone died in the year yep. in question yep. as kind of a yep. crutch. People die every year. Yeah, and then we use, it's a way to tick the box, appease the RNG. Yep. And today I am, in fact, doing that. But <laughs> for once, the fact that my guy died in the year 1732 is actually the most remarkable thing about him. Because he was so bland. And no, it's because the hero of today's story, a man Vanilla named Dave. William <laughs> Heisland, was Ooh. 111 years old when he died. Oh. No. 111 years old. I am so intrigued how you're going to stretch this out over 10 minutes. <laughs> It is it is quite a brief uh, story, but I just think he's really... I just okay. love this guy. So they have his birth certificate and everything. They've actually... Is this nailed on? No. However, who needs a birth certificate? They just cut his arm off and counted the rings, I'm assuming. <laughs> he, so he claimed to be born in 1620 in Wiltshire. And... Um, People are just kind of accept that there there was a guy named William Hasland who is registered to mm. be born in 1628 in in Wiltshire. It's possible that that's the same guy, but then still he lived to be over 100 years old. But let's let's believe him for what he says. Yep. William Hasland, 1620 Wiltshire. He first became a soldier at the age of 13. He fought in the English Civil Wars on the Royalist side, fighting for King Charles at the Battle of Edge Hill in 1642. And he was on the Royalist side for the entire Civil War, which ended about a month after his 31st birthday. From 13 to 31. Yeah. Wow. Oh, aunt. That is, we have, we have yet to scratch the tip of the iceberg. Of yeah, his, no, he lived like three times his, that length. <laughs> well, even of his soldiering career. Wow, okay. Um, so... When the war ended, even though he was on the losing side, he was permitted to go home because he was a fairly minor. He wasn't mm -hmm. a big officer or anything. And he just kicked it throughout the duration of the English Republic. He was a royalist, so he wasn't, I'm sure, a big fan of Oliver Cromwell. Um, then his next war wasn't until 1688, when he was 68 years old. He fought in the Williamite War in Ireland, a war between the Jacobite supporters of mm -hmm. James II and the Williamite supporters of William III. He fought in the famous Battle of the Boyne. Yeah. And he kept yeah. fighting until the war ended a few years later when he was 72. Nice. And you may think then he retired. Yeah. You would be wrong. <laughs> no way. He was not done. In 1709, in the War of Spanish Succession, that Ant's just talking yes. about, William once again took up arms. And at the age of 89 years old, he was on the battlefield. And, uh, what? Doing what? <laughs> Like doing, seriously, he's not leading a charge. He's not being a grenadier. <laughs> he's not on a horse. Yeah. He's not, he's not hoisting a flag. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe he did all of those things at once. This he was is just a man. napping. <laughs> That's what he was doing. He was just like the mascot. He yeah. Like, yeah. Hey, Can we just boys. like, what, going back, yeah. what was his first time on the battlefield? His first time, yeah, he became a soldier when he was 13. I think his first big battle was in the Civil War in 42. Right. Okay. So he was 20 two then okay okay fair yeah. enough i mean like yeah. even if he's like seven or eight years younger than he's saying yeah, he's still yeah, yeah. like he's still there or thereabouts yeah right? he's still old and at this point like it is absolutely confirmed that he is there and he is old and he's fighting we have mm -hmm. we maybe his birth date is wrong well, but the fact that did, he's still uh, around marshall did this didn't he like anyway but. yeah well so uh he please his, tell me he stops his very last battle was also the largest one he ever fought the battle of malplaquet 
He was in the Royal Scots Regiment. Oh. Yeah. Which had the distinction of having the oldest and youngest men on the field because William was 89 and there was a private McBain. Private fetus. <laughs> private fetus. Uh, there was a private McBain who apparently fought the battle with his three week old son strapped to his back. <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> No, he didn't. Do great pair. Well, I mean, it's great body armor, really. It's great, yeah. yeah. That yeah. is a fact. That, that was that was made up like 25 years later as a thing to say about the battle. You know what? <laughs> I'm so tired of you calling my facts, <laughs> my hard-earned facts into question. Everything I say is true. I believe you. <laughs> Thank you. That's Baby why, amazing. That's why I like you private, more. Private fetus was there. Private fetus. Um, yeah, Private McBain. So the war ended, the War of Spanish Succession ended, and William did finally retire. And I think he it's was a damning indictment on on just just daycare for children as well. Yeah, right. You know, it's I always know. been a problem. It's, <laughs> it's absolutely been a problem. Oh, I got to take him to the office today. <laughs> and my wife couldn't get off work, so uh, are you sure? I'm it's take a battle. Him to the battle. Yeah, it's a battle day today. You really sure? Uh, no, I really couldn't, be couldn't work it out. Uh, Babysitters wasn't available. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's uh, he's he's pretty chill. He'll just be on my back. Um, yeah, the war ended. Well, William finally retired. He was granted a pension of one crown a week. Nice. I don't know how much a crown for is for his ninety now, years of service. Yeah, it doesn't does seem like a lot. Seem sufficient <laughs> for his ninety years of service. He was the last survivor of the English Civil Wars, oh. and then he became a Chelsea pensioner. And mm. for listeners outside of the UK, the Chelsea pensioners are residents of the Royal Hospital Chelsea, which is a retirement home and a nursing home for former members of the British Army. And at the hospital, you could either be an out pensioner, which means you receive your pension but don't live in the hospital, or an in pensioner, which means you give up your pension in exchange for room and board and and clothing and everything. Notably, the Chelsea pensioners have to be free of any financial need to support a family or a spouse. And until 2009, they had to be male. And that's why back in the year 1723, William Heisland was forced to leave the Royal Hospital Chelsea when he got married at the ripe old age of 103 what? years old. What? What uh, what a legend. I know. <laughs> Still got it. 103, 103 like... years old, presumably to, I mean, you would have to assume a younger woman. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He outlives her. Are you kidding me? She dies. He returns to Royal Hospital Chelsea and becomes an in-pensioner again uh, (laughs) because he no longer has a wife. And then shortly after that, in 1732, he dies in the hospital at the age of 111. But not before sitting for an oil portrait that still hangs in the museum of the hospital. And by my calculations, he lived through the reigns of eight different English and then later British monarchs, as well as Oliver and Richard Cromwell. He saw dynasties come and go. He saw the Republic and the Restoration, the Acts of Union, pretty consequential stuff. And he's buried in the Royal Hospital burial ground. And I really liked the inscription on his tomb. I'm going to read the whole thing for you here. Here lies William Heisland, a veteran, if ever soldier was, Mm -hmm. who merited well a pension, if long service be a merit, having served upwards of the days of man, ancient but not superannuated, engaged in a series of wars civil as well as foreign, yet not maimed or worn out by either. His complexion was fresh and florid, his health hale and hearty, his memory exact and ready, in stature, he exceeded the military size. <laughs> <laughs> what an odd thing to have. Sorry, go on. In strength, he surpassed the prime of youth. And what rendered his age still more patriarchal, when above 100 years old, he took unto him a wife. <laughs> Read, fellow soldiers, and reflect that there is a spiritual warfare as well as a warfare temporal. Yeah, mm, that's quite nice. It's not exactly as pithy as Bismarck's, I'd say. <laughs> but, you know, it's still very yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah. it's it's quite um, quite lengthy. But you know what? If you make it to 111, yeah. you deserve to have as many words as possible There's on your tomb. spiritual warfare as well as temporal. Yeah. It's, quite, it's quite nice. Yeah, it's, it's quite, quite nice, quite, right? Poetic. That's absolutely amazing. Yeah, so that is just a fun little story about yeah. man, William I love, Heisler. I love um, people whose lives span eras that you don't usually yeah. connect. Yeah, mm. I think that's really fascinating. I was, I was just, well, I was just googling. I was trying to find an interview, which maybe we can link to it or something. Yeah, yeah. But there's a really interesting interview. So it is. In, there was a game show called the Sixty Four Thousand Dollar Question, uh-huh. and in the original one of the or, uh, original episodes of this thing from the early fifties, mm. there was an interview with a guy whose father had fought in the Revolutionary War. Wow. Because he was so it's just astonishing. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah you just don't don't 
join these up together. Yeah, yeah, his, totally. His father was like a 12-year-old drummer boy f- at very famous battles in the Revolution. Wow. Yeah. And then he, and he didn't have him until like his 70s. <laughs> and then this guy was 90 in his 90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is amazing. How it is really cool. And it's uh, like, that's easier to do in America because America is so, mm-hmm. you know, young. Uh, but like, so this guy was born in living memory of Queen Elizabeth the yeah. yeah, and died in the reign of, I think, George the second or maybe even george the third which is you know dynasties later and even in my family my father Uh was (laughs) weren't you at waterloo (laughs) no (laughs) well i was at waterloo but my but then because i'm 740 years old yeah yeah. actually my father fought with alfred the great yes that's right yeah Yeah, he had me when he was 600 years old your father was ethel ethel wolf ethel wolf that's right yeah Yeah, king ethel wolf (laughs) great um you're, you're not only podcasting royalty, you're also actual royalty. Royalty, royalty. Yes. That, that was a lovely story. And I will have my vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> In this life or the next. Uh, yeah, so that's a, just a nice little story about a very, very old man. Well, thanks so much for joining us. That's everything you'd ever need to know about the year 1732. Yeah. And uh, before we go and get the random number generator, just one small plea to our fans. Please do rate us on whatever platform you listen to, whether that's uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Good Pods. Good Pods. Good, on Good Pods, you can rate the actual episode itself, which oh, I think is quite cute. Yeah. cute. Yeah. Or if you are one of our many members that get this by audio cassette, just return, <laughs> return the self-addressed yeah. envelope with messenger with, foxes. Uh, with messenger fox with five stars. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. All that's left to do now, though, is Will. Yeah, and, and on that, I think if you're like the vast majority of podcast listeners, including like me, you just listen to the podcasts and you don't actually go in and yeah. rate it. And it is a bit of an effort. But just, you know, go and do that now. Like right now, just go and yeah. just jump in and do we'll the wait. five star yeah. thing. And then, and we'll then wait. it's done. We'll, we'll wait it's for done. you. And it just helps people find us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, right. So <laughs> on to, you're doing your proper job, please, Will. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we need a random number. Oh, yes, of course. Okay. <laughs> the right. random number generator is actually steaming right now. I think <laughs> yeah. it's overheating and you need to oh, boot it up. Yes. Okay. Uh, it is booting. And the next year <laughs> is... <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 1985. <laughs> That's so modern. Wow. That's pretty cool. That's almost too modern. That's pretty cool. That is cool. Okay. That's going to be like... Shotgun the amazing. history of synthwave music. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to talk about Devo. Devo? Yeah, Whip It. I don't know I've why that's the first like 80s band I thought of. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, great... I was born in 2005. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I can think of is is Michael J. Fox and a yeah. DeLorean. Yeah. And Home Alone? Was that around that time? Home that Alone? No, that's like, like 92. Oh, yeah. yeah. God, yeah. I'm so bad at this. You're bad at this. <laughs> 1985. That's going to be a banger. That's like, yeah. that is amazing. I'm yeah. so excited. Should we all dress <laughs> so... up in 80s attire for yeah. us? Yeah. Brilliant. I'm in. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting my hair into a side pony as we speak. I can finally wear my triple we're, denim. We're so excited by modern years. I know. <laughs> I'm so disappointed. I just by- <laughs> don't want to hear one more thing about the bloody Safavids. Yeah. You know? Especially just like obscurely uh, obscure what's years. What's going to be like- great is when Aunt still talks about Rome. <laughs> the Medici in 1985. In Pope John happen. Paul II. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, great. Okay, we'll see you then. See you in the Bye. 80s. <laughs> <laughs>